Well, good morning. good morning. Good to see you here today. We're glad that you're here, and we're especially happy to have some guests with us today. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. We'd like to get to know you better. Maybe you're looking for a new church home, a new church family. We'd love to have you consider our church for that. And uh, we'd love to get to know you better. So please sign the registration pad. There are these little green pads that are on the pews. Just look for yours there. And uh, we ask everyone if you would sign it today. Let us know that you're here in worship today. And if you're one of those guests that I mentioned earlier, please give us a way to get back in touch with you so we can answer any questions you might have or give you some more information. So some contact information would be helpful for us. Then your phone number or email address, whatever you're comfortable with. We'll get back with you this week and answer your questions or uh, give you more information. So we've got an uh, interesting week coming up in our life of our church. Tomorrow's Halloween, of course, but on, on the 1st of November, we will have DMA, Don't Mention Age. It's always the first Tuesday of the month, and it happens to be uh, the first Tuesday is the first day of the month. So DMA, don't let it slip up on you. It will be this week, Tuesday at noon in the Fellowship Hall. So we invite you to come and have a good meal with us. There have been 30 or 40 of us meeting every month, and they've got a trip planned. They're going to be telling you more about. We've got about 30 or so people already going. They're going to be going up to Kentucky to see the Ark Museum, but then there's some other stops they'll make, and even a riverboat uh, dinner cruise there. So they've got an exciting trip. So if you want to hear more about it or talk about it, uh, come Tuesday. So uh, also on Wednesday, of course, we have Wednesday Night Live. I've started a new class, but we've got ongoing classes. Uh, the meal is at 4.30, but runs till 6 when we have classes. And this week we're having tacos. So if you like tacos, come and enjoy that. I always enjoy the fellowship that we share around the table. And then uh, next Sunday, be aware that is daylight saving times ending. So you'll need to fall back on Saturday night. Now, I'm going to take a little time off to go do a wedding, and Trevor Fry will be preaching in this service next week. He'll be praying for Trevor as he prepares. We will not be having communion, though, since I won't be here. We'll push communion back one Sunday. So please be aware of that. And Miss Judy, I think you have an announcement for us. Yes. Um, if you pick up a hymnal and look at this stuff that's written on the page and have no idea in the world what all that means, we would like to help you understand that a little bit. We're going to have some music reading classes, very basic music reading classes. George and I will leave. It's going to be the next two Thursday nights at 530 here at the church. About an hour. It'll be fun. You don't have to join the choir afterwards or anything. Like that. It's no, no obligation. But if you would like to just, just learn a little bit more about what all the, the notation means uh, on a musical score, come and have some fun with us for the next two Thursday nights at 5 30. Continue. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stand and greet each other this morning.
remain standing if you're able and join us in our call to worship. We gather today to worship the one who created us, the one who calls us, the one who equips us, the one who loves us without end. With joyful hearts, let us worship God. Let us worship our loving creator and friend. Now we ask that you just remain standing if you're comfortable doing so and join us as we sing the verses of Christ for the world. We sing hymn number 568 and as the light of Christ enters our worship space. <laughs> Father, we pray for each element of our service today that you would bless it. The songs that we sing, the fellowship that we share, the gifts that we give, for your word as it's proclaimed. Lord, in all these ways, Lord, bless our lives today. Help us to be more like Jesus. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for the decisions that we're make, making. Lord, we pray for unity within our church that other uh, divisions would cease and we would come together in mission and in love. Lord, we pray for decisions being made by those who are going to the polls in the next week or so for elections around our country. Lord, we pray for our local leaders, our state leaders, our national leaders, and our world leaders that you would bring peace to the world. We pray for the refugees, the victims of this war, and we pray that you will be with them. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together in a free country today, and we pray for those who do not have that privilege. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this
stand. Let us join our voices together as we share this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, Miss Leslie is coming with our children's message. Come on, children, join her right here at the steps of the altar. trick-or-treating but sometimes when you're out there trunk-or-treating you might see something a little bit scary right you ever seen something scary when you've been out a little bit of costume that scared you a little bit well you know when I was a little girl I can remember when I was a little girl I can remember go, walking through my neighborhood and I had that one neighbor that always dressed up scary and had their house a little bit scary and and I was afraid but they were a nice neighbor it's just their door front looked a little bit scary, and I was always afraid to go up there. But you know what I had? I had my mom's hand. Yeah, I reached out and held. You, you don't want to hold my hand. Hey, hold my hand. <laughs> I reached out and I held her hand, and you know sometimes I squeeze it a little bit tighter. But I always went up anyway because I knew that I had my mom to keep me from being afraid, didn't I? When I was afraid, I knew all I had to do was reach out. Well, as you get older and bigger, sometimes. You go and do things without mom or dad, right? And you might not have them with you to grab their hand. But guess what? The Bible tells us that somebody else is always with us. Who's always? Who's always with us? God's always with us. The Bible says that over and over and over. So I think that's a pretty important thing for us to know. But two in particular that I picked out for you guys is Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you always. He didn't say sometimes. He didn't say in five minutes I'll be there. He said what? I'll be with you how long? Always. And then in Matthew 28, 20, it says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So he didn't say I'm with you always right now. He said I'm with you forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's pretty cool, right? I think that's pretty cool. What do you think? He said, I'm always with you. doesn't matter what you do. I'm always there. So I have a challenge for you like I always do. Whenever you're afraid, whenever you're afraid this week, do me a favor. Take your hands and squeeze them. Squeeze your hands together and pretend that you're squeezing the hand of God and ask him to help you when you're afraid. Can you do that for me? I think you can. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you that you're always with us. We're so glad that we can call on you whenever we are afraid. Help us remember that you're right beside us, holding our hands just like our parents and grandparents and grown-ups are, helping us through all the scary things in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ms. Leslie. Now they're going to Children's Church.
As we come to our time of offering today, let me share with you some good news about our church, some good things happening here, and some new ways that you can give this month. Uh, our missions committee has been at work, and of course we're uh, feeding the hungry every week down at the Homeless Coalition. But you may remember Share the Blessing, a Thanksgiving uh, dinner that we did at the church. So before I came here, I heard about Share the Blessing, but with COVID, we couldn't really do that in that way. Well, we're doing Share the Blessing again this year. This time, uh, we're going to go to the assisted living facility down by Pinecrest and going to be sharing a Thanksgiving meal with them. It's going to be a little early. It will be next week when we'll be sharing that. The food will be cooked and uh, served there, and uh, you will be a part of that because it's from uh, sponsored by this church, and your gifts and offerings help to pay for that, and we appreciate our missions committee for getting all of this together. Another way you can share the blessing, though, is by bringing your used, gently used, let's just say, uh, warm things like coats and jackets and uh, scarves and hoods and blankets and things like that, that we can help with our, our homeless friends downtown. And they will be collected. There's a collection place over here and I think at another entrance or two. So please bring those gently used items here so they can be distributed to those that need them. And also, of course, we want to thank you for your offerings today and your generosity in responding to God's command on your life to be generous and to be faithful in your gifts. Let's pray. Father, we pray for these gifts and all gifts that are given, whether they are financial or whether they are through uh, sweat and hard work, whether they are in food that is given and given out, or whether it's in a used jacket that we just don't need anymore or has passed its time in our lives. We thank you for all gifts that are given, those collected here today, and that will be collected in the next month. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
want to say one more word about next Sunday, and that is you probably realize that All Saints Day will be on Tuesday. We'll be uh, we'll be observing All Saints Sunday this coming Sunday. So even though we won't have communion, we will have the uh, memorial of those who have passed this past year, and we'll have the bell ringing and uh, those names announced and pictures shown. So. Uh, please be aware of that, and if you know the families of those that we'll be honoring that we've lost in the last year, please uh, remind them to come and be a part of that service. Last week in the book of James, it's a little letter that James wrote to the Christians that were scattered around because of persecution. Uh, he was talking about, be careful what you say. Uh, be careful how you use your tongue, your mouth what you say and how that can, like the rudder of a ship is a small part of the ship, uh, steer toward something good or steer toward destruction in the same way our tongues can do that in our lives. And we could say the same thing in modern society about our thumbs, couldn't we? Because we text with those with thumbs on our devices. Uh, we could say the same thing with our hands because that's a small part of your body too, but those fingers are typing on those keyboards and so on social media and in emails we can say destructive and hurtful things and we have to be careful about all of that all that would fit in the same sort of vein james moves on and looks at a different subject that is also concerning and something that is a challenge to our christian faith james wants us to not just stay where we are in our Lives. He wants us to move on. He wants us to grow up. He wants us to mature. And so some of these words that he say sound very direct and can sound very harsh to us. But James is trying to get us moving, trying to get us moving toward where God would want us to be in our Christian faith, not just, not just floating along with the drift. And so that's what we'll be looking at today. James realizes, and we need to realize, that our initial commitment to Christ, when we said yes to our Lord Jesus Christ, when we professed our faith in Christ, something happened in our body and began happening in our lives. We become a child of God at that point. We, we accept what God has for us. We may do that during confirmation when we profess our faith in Christ or sometime during that year of confirmation. We do, might do it in a worship service. Maybe you did it at a youth camp or at a children's camp when you realized that, that God's love was meant for you. But you're like the trailhead of a hike, a journey you're about to take. You realize that that's just the beginning of the journey. The journey continues from there. And the journey, the hike might have beautiful uh, things that you'll observe and might be just fulfilling in your life. But along that hike, you also have to realize that there are dangers and there are challenges that you'll have to meet as well. I think James is trying to put all that in perspective in our lives as we should. So let's read from part of this, the fifth chapter of James. The whole chapter, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, it's pretty harsh. Uh, it's dealing with problems in the church, and it's dealing with problems in individual lives here. But we're going to read just a few verses. So if you have your Bible, start to James chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Let's stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's Word. James says this, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the, the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Sometimes in saying, this is the word of God, thanks be to God, we say, yikes, really? I'm going to go there? Well, I need to tell you that I've heard it said in ancient Israel that with their court system mainly being based on a single judge making a single decision, that the accused would be brought into the presence of the judge, and the, the rule was that the, the, the one accused coming before the judge never looked up. 
They never showed their face. They kept their face to the ground the whole time that judgment was being rendered by the judge or the case was being heard. Now, there were two reasons for this. One was to show humility, deference before the judge, that your life was literally sometimes in their hands. And so you're being very humble and for their decision, hoping for the best one. But the other reason for that was very practical. These Israel, Israelites, Israelis, were in tribes. They belonged to certain tribes, Benjamin, Judah, you know, 12 tribes that they could have belonged to. Now, within the tribes, that's where that trial would have taken place. And the tribes were made up of these large extended families. And so the idea was not to look at the face of the judge, not to make eye contact, because if you did that, you may recognize, or the judge may recognize you as a relative. And so making that decision even more difficult for the judge. So the thing is, if the judge acquitted you, set you free, or if the judge even found you guilty but had mercy on you and set you free, then the judge would descend from their, their platform and come down and lift up your face lift up your eyes and look you in the eye. And that's really what this is talking about. God coming as our merciful God, as we are humble before God and coming and declaring that we are free. We are free indeed from our sins and God is lifting up our place, our face. Remember the erotic blessing that the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so, that's the picture here of us coming before God in this manner. James is talking to Christians in this rather stern chapter about the sins in their lives. The, the sins as the body of Christ is having sin within it and having splits and division within it and there are problems there. And as these individual Christians are having problems within their own lives, having a struggle to follow their Lord and Savior. Now, this is the kind of sermon you normally hear, is it, these days? Uh, especially in our denomination and in other churches around here, because most preachers today, like me, we want to preach on hope and healing. That's the side we want to come down on hope and healing, folks. That it's all about living your best life now. You see that guy on TV saying that? And turning your scars into stars. You know, hope and healing, which is great. That's the message I'd rather be preaching. Hope and healing. One of our famous Methodist preachers one time said, you need to preach hope and healing because there's a heartache in every pew, every Sunday. And I do believe that. If you live my life, you know that I get a lot of messages and, and texts and other things from people all week. And I know there's a lot of pain and heartache out there. There's a lot of healing that must be done. But what we learn from the medical community is this, in order for us to receive healing in our lives, in order to be whole once again, we have to first find out what the problem is. If you go to the doctor and you've got a problem, you've got an issue in your life, the first thing they're going to do, they're going to say, well, just go forth and be well. They're going to diagnose what that problem is. They're going to run some tests on you. They're going to draw some blood. They're going to find out what's going on in your life. They're going to get those tests back to zero in on what your problem is. And it's only then that the hope and healing can begin in your life. Because from that diagnosis, they're going to either schedule a surgery, they're going to prescribe a medicine, they're going to send you to therapy, they're going to try to help you in that way. But only after the diagnosis has been made and the diagnosis is correct. And the diagnosis for the problem that James is talking about, both in the life of that church and in the lives of those people, the problem was pride. Pride. You think about it. Think about pride becomes the root sin in our lives many times. I mean, there are other sins, but the one we really have to deal with mostly is pride. 
It goes back to the, the Garden of Eden, to the book of Genesis, to that original story of sin and the fall. It was the serpent that says, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Talking about the forbidden fruit, the, the, the knowledge of good and evil. For God knows that the day you eat of it, that is the forbidden fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes. And the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took its fruit and she ate. She also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. Thus the fall. That's the fall. And that's what we experience. It's that wanting to be like God, wanting to be our own master, wanting to be in charge of everything. That's what they were looking for, more power in their lives, not to live as children of God, but on their own. St. Augustine said that pride is the commencement of all sin because it was this that overthrew the devil. Do you ever think about that? The little bit of origin story that we have of Satan in the Bible seems to say that he was once a beautiful archangel, but he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be over God. He wanted to be in charge. And so he and his angels rebelled and were cast out of heaven. And so pride, when you think about the word in English, I is the very center of that word. I, me, myself, my interest, my agenda, my wants, what I want, what, my, what benefits me. And so we began to, to think about that. Now, I know we use the word pride in different ways in our language, so it doesn't get such a bad rap because most of the time it's in positive ways. When we see someone with a beautiful home that's meticulously cared for, a beautiful lawn there, we think, my, those people take great pride in where they live. And that's not a bad thing. We're just saying they're very careful and very hardworking about making that place as nice as it can be. I always say to someone who's a craftsman or craftswoman that they take great pride in their work. We're not saying something evil about them. We're saying that they are very skilled and meticulous about their work, very careful about the work that they do and how that turns out. And that's a good thing. The pride we are talking about is that root sin in our lives that wants us to take over. Instead of Jesus being the Lord of our lives, we want to be the Lord of our lives. And from that pride comes so many other sins. Think about it. Egotism. It's all about me. Conceit. I'm better than everyone else. Envy. Why don't I have what they have? I work as hard. I work harder than they do. How come they get that and I don't? Prejudice. My kind of people are better than those kind of people. We know, the, we know what's going on over there. We know them. We can judge them before we even know them personally because our, my, my race my culture is superior to theirs. That's part of pride. Self-centeredness, it's all about me. It's what I want in my life. All the values that I have or what I have built up, what I have done for myself. Selfishness in terms of I'm working harder than anybody else in this company and I never get what I deserve. I'm the only one who cares about this family. I'm the only one keeping it together. Pride comes out in so many ways in our lives. It expresses itself more and more, and it shows a life that is controlled by the ego, by the self, and not controlled by the Lord Jesus Christ. So years ago, we had these little gospel tracts. I don't know if you remember those. I think they're still around somewhere because you remember there was a time when we told people about Jesus. Wasn't that a good, isn't that a good idea that we actually would tell people about Jesus? Well, there was a time when we used those little gospel tracts to do that. So we didn't have to carry a whole Bible with us and try to find all those scriptures in Romans, you know, to tell people about Christ. If someone said, hey, tell me about your faith or hey, this seems to be working with you. Let, let me know what, what's happening so it can happen in my life. So we had these little gospel tracts 
And they were very simple, and they just had this simple road of salvation there where people could understand in simple diagrams what, that they had a need for Christ in their life and God could come in and transform their lives. And so one of those little diagrams in that book had kind of a heart, you know, the kind of heart we normally would draw, representing the human heart, the soul. And it had a little chair on it, a little throne. And it said that here's your condition now. You are, your pride is sitting on that throne, on that chair. You are in control of your heart. But when you invite Jesus Christ to come into your life, something changes. You yield that throne, that control to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it had a little cross on that throne, that little chair. It said now Jesus is in control of your life once you invite Christ to come in. Well, that's a very simplistic diagram, and it may help you understand how you're supposed to be as a Christian. But we know that that's both the beginning of the journey, but also the difficulty of the journey. Because even though inviting Christ into our heart means that we are now a part of God's kingdom and part of God's children, and we will live forever with Christ in glory, that happens, but also we begin this long process in our lives where our old nature, that pride, wants to come back and sit on that throne again. It wants to be in control. And our challenge every day becomes getting Jesus to stay, helping Jesus to stay on that throne in control because God still gives us free will to do that. So it's still a valued decision we make every day of who's going to be in control of my life. That's why a morning devotional or a morning prayer is so important to give the day to Christ so that God stays in control of your life. James experienced this and talked about this battle within us to keep our pride where it needs to be and to keep Jesus in control of our lives. But Paul struggled with the same thing. If you read the book of Romans, the seventh chapter of Romans is about Paul's difficulty with this. He said it like this, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, he let God fight that battle for him. But we do have that battle. We have that going on inside of us. And we think in terms of the world, we hear what the world tells us is that, oh no, all those urges and all those things that you have in your life and all those things that drive you and change your priorities, they're all just perfectly natural. Perfectly natural for you to feel that way. Well, that's true, but that's, that's what God is trying to transform in your life. Those perfectly natural desires and those perfectly natural tendencies and those things that put ourselves first and others way behind, that claw to the top. That's all perfectly natural, but it's not what God wants in our lives. So what does James tell us? To do here? Well, first of all, he says to submit yourselves to God. He's very direct with that. Submit yourselves to God. So does that mean to do what those ancient Israelis would have to do before their judge and not make eye contact? I don't believe. I don't believe that's what the picture is. I don't think God requires us to grovel before God in, in all that we do every day. This is a military term, the word submit. This is a term that comes from military service. So if you and I were young enough to go and volunteer to go into the armed services, one thing we would understand that when we went into the armed services, we would be going through basic training. And one of the things those, that basic training is gonna tell us is you have to obey orders. And you accept that as part of the life. If you're an enlisted person, that's going to be from a sergeant or an NCO. If you're an officer, that's going to be from a higher officer. And there's always going to be a higher officer. And so you learn that that is your life. That is your lot in life, 
as long as you're in the military, is that you submit to orders. You submit to those in authority before you. And what James is saying here, you've got to submit like that as Christians, understanding that that is part of the Christian life. You're submitting to the authority of God in your life. And so that helps us put that in perspective, get that pride out of our way in our lives. But the other thing James tell us, tell, tells us is to draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Now this may sound like legalism and a lot of people don't like the book of James because they think, well, there it is. That's just legalism. That's just telling you, you got to work harder and harder and harder. You got to be better and better and better in order for God to accept you. That is not what James is saying here. James is writing to a group of Jewish Christians. They all had a Jewish background that would be called Messianic Christians today. And so they understood the images from the Old Testament about drawing near to God. In other words, coming to God in worship. And the first place of worship for them was the tabernacle. And when they would cross the threshold of the tabernacle and come before God in worship, there would be a basin next to them. And it would have water in it. And the first thing they would do is they would cleanse their hands in that water. And while they were doing that, they were praying that God would cleanse them before they came into worship. What a beautiful image, I think, that God is always ready to forgive us when we ask forgiveness. But we have to be conscious about doing that. And so he's saying, cleanse yourselves and draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. When they entered into the temple, they did the same thing. There was that basin there for them to experience that water, to remind them to cleanse their hearts, confess their sins, and receive God's forgiveness. Wouldn't hurt us to have a basin back there, would it? And of course, you've been in churches that had a font, a baptismal font there. And when people come in, they get some of that water. And I know for a lot of them, it's, it's a ritual. They don't think much about it. But the idea is before you come into worship with God, that you cleanse yourself, that you ask forgiveness, that you start anew with God. And through experiencing that and remembering your baptism, that God has marked you as a child of God from your birth, that God is working in your life and reaching out to you. So it says, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you, not through works, not through groveling, not through that sort of thing, but just knowing who we are before God and that we are flawed human beings. I get to teach on Wednesday nights, on Wednesday morning as well, and people come up and tell me different things while I'm teaching, after I'm teaching. One person last week said that they had a friend that would come to worship, mainly on communion Sundays, the first Sunday of the month. And they love to come to communion. And I was thinking, well, they, they love to come down and, and receive the bread and the fruit of the vine, or maybe they, like in, in the path, they come forward and they do that. But that's not why they love communion. They love communion because of the prayer of confession, that we all stand before the altar here and we confess our sins before God and that they just needed that in their lives at least once a month to come and publicly confess their faith before God. Remember the older churches, and you may have seen them out in the country, they had mourner's benches. They had places where people would go, and there was a special section of the sanctuary where that's where you went to confess, to get things right before God. Why? Because that internal battle is going on in, in your life every day. And it is perfectly natural for us to yield to that temptation of pride in our lives and the other temptations that come before us. But it is the will of God and the transforming power of God that comes into our lives and makes Jesus Lord of our lives once again. And we pick up and have a new start. The Jews had an image still today of good and evil within their lives. And they, the rabbis called them the two dogs, the good dog and the evil dog. And they're kind of fighting every day with our values and our decisions and, and our priorities. And someone says, well, which wins, the good or the bad? And the rabbis would say, the one that you feed, the one that you feed. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. 
The thing is, God has already made his first step. God is already trying to draw near to you. God has sent Jesus Christ and our son and our his son and our Savior. God has already reached out to you. Have you reached out back to God? The Wesleys knew a lot about this. As they went around and they preached, a lot of people would receive Christ into their hearts. But the Wesleys knew that that was just the beginning of that journey of hope and healing. That in order for them to, to go forward with that, they had to get into smaller groups. They called them bands and classes, and they organized them wherever they preached the gospel. And these groups would keep each other accountable. They would be the group to which you could confess and stay strong and study the Bible and pray together and find hope and healing through those small groups. Today we have Sunday school classes, we have other classes that meet, we have prayer groups that meet here. And if you don't have a small group like that that you can go to and be really honest to God and honest with yourselves and with them, you need to find one. If you don't have one, please come to me and we'll try to find a group for you. Or we'll organize a group by people that don't have those groups. But we need that in order to grow and continue to transform in our faith. Someone has asked, if you're not as close to God as you used to be, let me ask you, who moved? I can assure you it wasn't God. Who moved? It's a time for you to move back toward God the time for you to confront the pride and the other issues in your life today. Who is on the throne of your life today? Who will be on the throne of your life tomorrow? Is it Jesus, your Lord and Savior? Or is it your selfish pride? Let's pray. Father, we recognize that in order for us to find hope and healing, we have to diagnose the problem. And for many of us, that problem is pride. It comes in so many different forms, but Father, all of them are destructive. All of them are trying to push you out of our lives. All of them are very natural, but they are not what you want for our best life. So Father, help us to address that today. That issue of pride today, that issue of selfishness today, that issue of wanting to take control over you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song of commitment now. And it is wherever he leads, uh, wherever he leads me, or where he leads me, it is hymn number 338. And during this time, maybe it's time for you to, to come clean and come honest to God and realize that you push God out of your life in so many ways. That's an issue we all face. You're not alone with that. We stand as a community and do that as well. So let us stand now as we sing. If you'd like to come and pray or come and talk to me about this, or if you've never trusted Jesus Christ in your Lord and you would like to do that today, I'd love to pray about that with you as well as we sing.
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you grace. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Amen.